Well, we're in the February, January blah, but it's important in these times of the year to get outside, even though there's lots of snow and it can be a little bit cold. We do have to get outside. It's good for us. A friend of mine, Mike, was skiing at a local ski hill. He was standing in a lift line waiting to get on and go up the hill. And uh, he heard in the background the, this noise and this kind of screaming. But he really didn't pay attention to it. It had nothing to do with him. But it kept getting louder and louder and louder until finally he was forced to turn and look to see what this screaming was. And just as he turned, a lady ran into him, broke both her front teeth, <laughs> cracked his ribs, and uh, uh, made a big bloody mess all over him and the snow in front of him. You know, uh, the lady had been, had been screaming, get out of my way, kind of. Uh, she was saying, get out of my way. Well, that's what she meant. But what she was actually saying was, ah! And Mike should have interpreted that, get out of my way. But sometimes what we hear isn't what the person means. Like, for instance, when it comes to God. God says to us, I forgive you, but we don't feel forgiven. And so we don't really believe him. Like he's saying it, but we just don't understand it. Or sometimes God says to us, I will make, give you, provide for you all that you need. But you know, we're struggling with our career. We're struggling with payments and debt. We're, we're struggling because we're looking for a spouse. And, and God isn't delivering. And so we kind of just go out on our own and do it our own way. God says that he's good and that all he does is good. But uh, all we can hear is the circumstances that we have around us. And it certainly doesn't feel like God is good. And so we don't trust him. Or there are times when God says to do some hard things, like have a hard conversation with people that have hurt us or sinned against us. But it's so hard that we're not willing to take that step of obedience. You see, God speaks, but all we hear is, ah, uh, we don't hear what he means. And that's exactly what was going on in the next covenant that we're going to look at. So we're in our big picture uh, series. It's a study of the scripture from a 30,000 foot level. And if you remember the six C's that uh, summarized the whole Bible, really. It's creation and then consequences that came from the fall and then the covenants, the promises God makes. And then we have the cross and the church and then finally the new creation. When mankind sinned, we left God with a choice because of the consequences of our sin. Remember the five F's, the five F words that we had, flight, we're running from God, uh, fighting with one another, flawed in our basic responsibilities, fatality, fatality, death, because of our sin. And the choice for God was to either leave us to our consequences and have to face them on our own or to rescue us. And God chooses to rescue us. Now, if you ever wonder if God cares about you, because sometimes our circumstances make us wonder that, prayers that we want answered aren't answered, situations we have to face, health concerns, we watch people we love, go through difficult health concerns, even die. We wonder, does God even love me? The next time you have that question, just stop and ask yourself this. God could have righteously left me to the consequences of the decision to sin, and yet he chose to rescue me at a cost that was enormous to himself. I mean, if you ever wonder if God loves you, just go back to that fact that God chose to put us, you and me, ahead of himself so that he could rescue us. So we've been looking at covenants, God's promises of what he's going to do in the future. We first looked at the Abrahamic covenant where God promises that he's going to remove all the results and the consequences of the fall. Then we looked at the Mosaic covenant, which was an invitation to those who had been rescued. This is now how you live to honor me. And today I want to look at the third major covenant in the Old Testament, the Davidic covenant. After the king, that's David, was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, here I am living in the house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. So Nathan replied to the king, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it for the Lord is with you. 
And so David realizes God has blessed him. And so now he wants to honor God and do something great for God. But that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, go and tell David, my servant, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? Have I not dwelt in a house from the day I brought up the Israelites out of Egypt to this day? I've been moving from place to place in a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of the rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people, why have you not built a house of cedar for me? You know, the curious response from God to David. David says, I want to do something great for you. And then he, it, it, it's like a son who uh, comes to his dad and says, you know, dad, uh, I've been very successful in business, as you know, but it really was because of the way you brought me up, the values you instilled in me, the education you got. You gave me a start. And so now I, I, I want you to th get rid of that Toyota Tercel that you've been driving around. And here's the keys to a brand new Mercedes to say thanks. And then the father looking at his son going, have I ever said I minded driving in a Tercel? Did I ever want anything different? I don't want your Mercedes. What is going on? So why would God respond this way to David? It's like David hears, ah! But God is trying to say to him, David, I'm going to do something far bigger, far greater than you could ever have dreamed. How I think is way beyond what you think. Nathan says, God says to Nathan to tell David, look, I took you from the pasture and from tending flock and appointed you to rule over my people. You, you were nothing. You were in obscurity. You, you, you were looking after sheep way out in a field and I raised you up, but I have a plan for that. I have a plan to build something that's far greater than just a stone temple. I'm building for eternity. And then God uses this opportunity to reverse David's plan to build for God. And instead, God is going to build something using David, or at least through David. And so he makes a covenant, promises with David. So God says to David, the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. And when your days are over, and you rest with your ancestors, I'm going to raise up your offspring to succeed you, somebody from your own flesh and blood. So immediately in this covenant with David, these promises, he aligns it with the Abrahamic covenant. If you remember the Abrahamic covenant, God said to Abraham, through you, I'm gonna bless the entire world. And we find out that it's through the seed of Abraham. So somebody who's going to come from Abraham's line is God is going to use to bless the entire world. Now he becomes even more specific. David, of course, is from the line of Abraham. But from David's line is going to come one through whom he is going to build a house. He said, he's the one who will build a house for my name. Interesting, David said, I want to build a house for you. And God says, no, you're thinking too small. I'm thinking way bigger. And one of your ancestors is going to build a house for my name. Now, interesting, the term house can refer to like a place you live, a dwelling, wood or stone. It can refer to a group of people like a clan or a family, the house of Jacob, Jacob and all his sons and all their relatives. But in scripture, there's another meaning that God has for it here. And it comes out in Hebrews chapter three, verse six. But Christ is faithful as the son over God's house. And we are his house. If indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. So this house is not a wood or stone. It's not even a family. It's an entire kingdom of people. And God already in David making this covenant sees what he is going to do through the descendant of David. He is going to build a house that encompasses the entire world. Now notice in verse 13, a little further along, God is telling David about the promise he's going to make to him. And he says, not only is he the one that will build my house and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, this is an interesting promise because the descendant of David that God has in mind is going to sit on David's throne. He's going to rule, 
but the throne is going to last forever. Now, some people think this refers, this passage refers to Solomon, who indeed will build a temple for God after David and will sit on David's throne. The problem is Solomon doesn't sit forever on the throne. He dies and passes on. In fact, his throne kind of ends after the exile. There's no king in Israel, but there is one descendant of David who does sit on a throne forever. In fact, when Jesus is born and God promises Mary that she's to call her this uh, baby she's having as a virgin, Jesus, God says, the angel says to her, he will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord is God will give him the throne of his father, David. We're linking back to the covenant. Remember, Jesus is a thousand years after David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever and his kingdom will never end. So Jesus is the only king who's ruled forever. And by the way, Jesus is sitting on that throne right now. As we go through this pandemic in the world, it kind of doesn't feel like Jesus is on the throne. It doesn't feel like anybody's in control. But remember what we hear, ah, and what God is saying can be two different things. Sometimes we don't hear God clearly. He thinks much bigger than us. And I am convinced that the King Jesus is sitting on throne, the throne of this world, and that he has purpose and reason and value in this global pandemic. We heard from Ron, uh, uh, Ron Pierce just a couple weeks ago on what God is doing in China and in Vietnam and Ethiopia and Israel, all over the world, thousands and millions of people turning to Christ because of the fear and the struggle that this pandemic is bringing. And I would guess that in your life, God is doing some work in your family, in you, in your kids because Jesus is on the throne and this pandemic is here because he intends for it to be here. It will last for as long as he tends for it to last and he will accomplish things in our lives that perhaps even now we don't even know that he is doing, but we can trust him that he is a good ruler and that he is in control. Now notice what else God says and promises to David in his covenant. He said, I will be his father and he will be my son. Now, that is an unusual relationship, not often talked about in the Old Testament. And when we move to the New Testament, we see the depth of what uh, the promise that God was foreshadowing in Jesus, because we see in John chapter one, verse 18, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only son who himself is God and is in closest relationship with the father. And he has made the father known. No Old Testament scholar ever dreamed that God was a trinity and that God would leave heaven and come to earth. But that's what God is promising and that's what he's referring to in this Davidic covenant, this one who will descend from David. Now, one more thing that we are told from the promises of God to David is that when he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. Now that's unusual that a king would be beaten except for if he was totally defeated. And yet God says, I'm going to have him beaten. He is going to suffer. Um, and yet uh, I'm not going to take the kingdom away from him like I took it away from Saul. Now this is a reference to the sacrifice of Jesus that is part of the plan of God. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter writes, when they hurled their insults at him, meaning Jesus, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he didn't make threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to God who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. The plan of God promised in the covenant to David is that the one who would come from David and build a house for God, a house that is eternal, a house that is worldwide, would happen through the suffering and the pain of that king who descended from David. There's no other person in scripture in the world that fulfilled the covenant that God made with David other than Jesus Christ. I'm sure if you're listening to this, it can sound a little cryptic uh, 
and unclear. I mean, you hear all these promises I'm talking about that God made David and were fulfilled in Christ. And to you, it just sounds like, ah, you're not getting the message. It doesn't make sense. Why so cryptic? Uh, That's a good question. You know, there's a hiddenness about God, uh, intentional hiddenness. You know, if God were to reveal himself in all of his glory, nobody could resist him. Nobody could turn away from him. It would be like if he showed up to you and showed himself to you, it would be like a shotgun wedding. How can you say no if you saw God in all his glory? He's so magnificent, he's so powerful, he's so full of glory. We would just drop if we saw him for who he is in his fullness. But instead, God remains hidden in our world, hidden in the sense, not that we can't find him, but so that we don't see the fullness of his glory. Why would he do that? He does it for us. He does it so that you and I can make a choice of whether or not we want to follow God. You see, in a shotgun wedding, you don't have a choice. And if God were to show up in his glory, we wouldn't have a choice. But he allows us, if our heart wants to seek him, we will find him and we will begin to understand him as we seek him. And he will reveal himself to us. And we can choose whether or not we want to receive him as our savior, whether we want to submit and be a part of the kingdom that he is building. You see, God isn't about being right. I mean, everybody's going to know that he's right when we all stand before him. In fact, God is love, we're told. God's about love. He wants only people that truly love him. And so rather than forcing people to submit to him, he gives us the choice because he loves all of us and we all get to choose whether or not we want to love him. In the end, all of us will know that he's right, that he is God, and that we will all give account to him. But today, he remains partially hidden so that those that don't want him can live their life without ever being forced to surrender to God, even find arguments why he doesn't exist or he's not a work today. But for those who want him, if you seek him, God says, you will find me. Scientist Dr. Michael Strauss wrote a book, The Creator Revealed, and in it, he examines the scientific basis and evidence around the Big Bang and fine-tuning argument and other things to show that faith in God and belief in God is actually very reasonable, lines up with the evidence that we have. Now, author uh, Martin Rousen says, I don't care what evidence there is. In fact, if God showed up and revealed himself to me, I still wouldn't believe. In fact, I quote him and he says, I don't believe in God, not because I can't, meaning not because there isn't sufficient evidence, but because I don't want to. You know, it's one thing to say, uh, well, I'm not sure the evidence points toward a God and then go search the evidence, that's seeking God. But to just say, I don't believe in God without examining the evidence, without thinking through the arguments, without reading his word, is probably more a heart issue than it's a head issue. You know, if you don't want to believe in God, there's nothing that can be done. That's a heart issue that only you can solve. You see, God wants you from the heart to follow him. And I just want to encourage you that if you've arrived at the decision that you don't believe there's a God or that he's real, ask, did I arrive because of the evidence or is it just, I don't want to? I don't want to have to give account of my life. I don't want to have to live in a way I don't want to live. I don't want to have to live somebody else's way. I just want to do my own thing. You know, I want to encourage you that if that's where your heart is, to examine that. Is that the way you want to go into eternity? Ignoring the evidence and just settling on a decision because, damn, my heart, I don't want God. At least be honest with yourself as you move forward. The Davidic covenant is God's promise that his great king would come and establish the kingdom that will rule the entire world. And that's why Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, a thousand years later, remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. Two things Paul wants them to know. Jesus raised from the dead and a descendant of David. He's the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. He's the one through whom God is going to reconcile and restore this world spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically. Now Jesus 
came to the world, died on the cross, and then gave a mission to his followers, the church, us. He said, I want you to make disciples of the entire world. I want you to take the message of restoration and reconciliation and go to the entire world and tell them about the opportunity they have to be restored with God. And when we talk about our my four, that's exactly what that is. You know, our my four is the four people we're asking God, please use me to help these people be restored to you, God. Use me. I'm going to intercede for them. I'm going to invest in them. I'm going to invite them. But would you be at work through me in them? And you know, when we are reaching out to other people, not only is it an act of compassion that we care about them and what will happen to them in eternity when they stand before God, but it is also an act of obedience in which we're joining in with the plan of God for what he fully intended thousands of years ago would be happening today, and that is the kingdom of Jesus Christ would be marching throughout this world. And one day when he returns, and he is going to return, the physical manifestation of that kingdom will be here on earth. From, from province to province and country to country and, and continent to continent and sea to sea, the kingdom of Jesus Christ will rule this world. And when we obey, when we join in his mission, when we, when we, every, when we face our fears, when we speak to those we know and that we're praying for, when we stand for the name of Jesus Christ, we are advancing that kingdom. We are part of building an eternal worldwide kingdom a kingdom that God has promised from thousands of years ago that will come to pass. So really there's only one question left and that is, are you in? Are you in on the mission? And if not, why not?